What's going on, guys? This is Brian Jackson, Men's Comics, and this is that Bolo Show. That's right, the Be On Lookout Show, where we're covering your new comic book day books. We're covering those first appearances, the reader buzz, the variant buzz, following at the end with Jack's long-term play. We are recording this the night before new comic book day. So, news may change, but no matter what, these are books that people are talking about this week, right? Absolutely. Yeah. These are the books that are spiking already on social media, already seeing those secondary market pre-sales, hitting those uh, cover price and the above. Uh, a lot of good books to talk about. And definitely some trends we're noticing here, Brian. Some late printings are uh, all over the list. Yes. And we're getting into it right now with those first appearances. First book we want to talk about in the first appearance is one of those second prints. And we're talking about that Dark Knight's Death Metal, Legends of the Dark Knight number one. We all know that gives us that first Robin King, right? That's right. We just talked about this on three up, three down last night. Um, this was part of the down portion as we just get a simple color change. But nonetheless, this is going above cover price. Um, Robin King is red hot. Uh, we talked about the success of the characters in the modern market right now. All of these kind of modern characters are certainly spiking. So this is one that if you can get for cover price is a solid pickup. Yes. You talk about a simple color change, but Marvel doesn't do that. And the next one, the first appearance, we got that strange Academy number one third print with a new cover. Yeah, new cover, get all, again, all of those first appearances right on the cover. Um, also get Dr. Strange front and center. This I'm real bullish on. I think this book long term is, is a big time book. We've heard a lot of reports that Marvel wants to make Strange Academy their Harry Potter, that they see this as like a long term movie and TV franchise. I'm very bullish on, on this property in general. I think as long as they keep releasing late printings for number one, uh, comic buyers should keep buying them up for cover price and below. Right. And then the last one we're talking about first appearances this week is that Fantastic Four Antithesis number one. Yeah, and you know, a lot of these first appearances that come out, specifically we've seen a ton in the Fantastic Four line. I haven't really liked this one. I'm intrigued by. Um, I'm not saying that this is a go hard first appearance, but I'd say this is a two copy in the short box, stick away and forget about. Antithesis is the opposite of Galactus. So you're getting kind of um, a, a ulterior point of view. This is a character that you never know could be used. Uh, we certainly know Galactus is going to be introduced in the MCU. Um, it, you never know where they're going to pull from when they start talking about Fantastic Four stuff. So this is an intriguing one. I just like the relation to Galactus. That's going to wrap up first appearances. So now we're going to move over real quick into those reader buzz books. As we always say, this is my favorite section of the week. It's a little bit small this week. But still great books nonetheless. The first one we're talking about is probably the big DC title, and that's that Three Jokers number one. Yeah, you know, the book that I actually um, I've gotten a chance to read already and I really enjoyed is actually Red Hood and the Outlaws this week. Um, but it just didn't make that, even though it's a Joker War tie in, the Joker War tie ins this week did not carry the reader buzz enough to make the list. But everything DC Comics was firmly, firmly, firmly about Three Jokers. Um, that was definitely the, the, the book that everybody was talking about. Um, it's the book we're going to talk about here uh, later on. Um, and it's definitely the one that everyone was anticipating from a reader level. Next book we're going to talk about is one that we've had the creator team multiple times on this channel. We talk about this book a lot. People are just now starting to catch on to it. Now we've had a whole first volume, a one shot, but we are getting Canto 2, issue number one. Yeah, I love that people are talking about it. You know, it's it's kind of one of those things where people start liking the rock band that you've been liking for years. Um, there's a part of you that yeah, gets Nickelback. <laughs> there's a part of you that gets salty, and you're like, you know, you know, this is this is my band. Um, but at the same point, man, I, I just want people to understand how great Canto is as a story, how great it is as a property, how great these creators are, Drew Zucker and David Boer. Um, great individuals, great talent. Um, I think I think both of them are gonna do big things in this industry. Uh, and then they, they're really putting together a great book. Like they understand what it takes as far as like 
new covers on late printings, um, marketable incentive covers. The 125 and the 110 incentive for this this book are incredible. Um, the 125 giving you that like stained glass almost look, kind of like look, church glass. Absolutely amazing looking um, cover. Gorgeous. Uh, the colors, the, the whole aesthetic of that cover is great. And then the 110 cover, you come with the Ben Bishop cover where you, you know, you're hitting a classic homage to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one, which is certainly an issue that is synonymous with IDW, synonymous with Ben Bishop and his work with Ninja Turtles. Um, to bring that into the world of Kanto, it, it kind of plays into to two markets and hits that all ages uh, uh, category. I think both of those variants are, are long-term success and there's no doubt in my mind they'll continue to see success. Uh, I'm not surprised that they're already selling above ratio. And it, it's funny, too, because we talked about this on the FOC, Brian. What do we have to say to get people to fully get on board with Canto? Stop being caught off guard. They were caught off guard by the one shot, which the one shot cover A is selling above cover price. The the incentives are selling well above ratio. Um, we've seen in the first volume, uh, you know, issue number one is a, a major back issue. And then the, the incentives sell for what they sell for, as well as the convention exclusives. So, uh, there's no stopping the Canto trend, seven seasons and a movie, and stay tuned uh, for more Canto content on the Simple Ones Comics YouTube channel because we've got another interview coming talking about this second volume with uh, you know David Boer and Drew Zucker. That's right. So if you guys are watching this Thursday night, just last night on Wednesday, we had them on to record another episode. We're going to end up creating a playlist on the channel because that'll be the third time that we've had him on talk canto each time's fantastic you can see it from right before the first canto number one launched through that end of that first volume now going into the launch of that second series is going to be great definitely if you're a canto fan you're going you're not subscribed to this channel go ahead and subscribe and click that bell notification so you get notified when that video drops and it will be very soon but the next one we're talking about in that reader buzz is teenage mutant ninja turtles the ongoing issue 108. Yeah, so Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is getting that kind of solid carryover buzz um, that you're getting. Um, the back issue market was late to catch up to issue 101 through 105. Um, but once they did, now you're seeing that kind of carryover 106, 107, 108. Um, the new character that debuted a couple issues ago, the Slithery, that the front and center, you get a new villain. Um, and this issue is really surrounding that character. So you're getting kind of the buzz there from, from that. So I think this entire TMNT as a property is hot right now. Um, how long it'll go. We're going to need another, probably another action packed issue to draw people in um, to kind of keep that buzz going. But at the same point right now, TMNT has the market's attention. Like I said, it's a pretty short section, but there's the reader buzz for this week. But now, as we say, the shiny object, we're getting into the variant buzz. Here's a book we're going to talk about. That's right. We get that spawn number 309, the gunslinger variant. Yeah, Brian, and I think we got a, a, a punk ass bitch alert uh, on this yeah, one. Yeah, punk ass bitch. Uh, because, uh, you know, Brian, uh, you, people seem to like um, him reacting to the Midtown price hike that we saw with Robin King. And if you thought that that $10 price hike with the Robin King cover B was bad, you're now getting Midtown pricing this Gunslinger Spawn um, Todd McFarlane variant at $25 for a $2.99 variant that they undoubtedly paid about $1.50 or less for. Um, and you can save that uh, free market capitalism bullshit for, for another day because the reality is, while, yes, they can price whatever they want, um, if they are going to continue to be the retailer, the distributor, and um, the secondary market, then, you know, customers are going to decide um, where they spend their money. Um, Midtown yeah. going to be old town. <laughs> yeah, it, it just it, it it those I think that is all short sighted uh, business practices, um, whatever kind of money um, they would have made off of the gouging of this book would pale in comparison to what they could potentially lose from a customer base who's going to continue to feel alienated and continue to feel like every time a book gets hot. Um, you only want to sell me shitty books for cover price. You don't want to sell me anything popular for cover price. Uh, and that, that's the feeling you start to get after a while. And, and that, that's not a good feeling. It doesn't feel like an even playing field. 
Um, and, you know, you can talk about pull lists and this, that, and the third. And yes, there's a lot of options, but that, that, that is bad aesthetics for the wrong is wrong. Right. It's just not, I, I can only explain, you know, retail principles so many times, uh, you know, the difference between the first market and the second market and the dangers that come from a business. And I, when I say this, I don't say this from like a salty customer perspective from a, from, from the business's perspective, the business is actually endangering themselves by trying to participate in multiple markets. And, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense yet. It continues to be something that they do short-sightedly. And it's unfortunate because it, we talked about this on 3Up3Down Three Three last week with the Gunslinger Spawn, with the fact that Gunslinger Spawn is a lot of positivity. But I promise you there will be more people on Wednesday talking about that stupid Midtown price than there will be talking about the heat behind this issue in general. Either way, I think uh, Gunslinger Spawn is due for a, a spinoff series at this point because it, the, the sales of... of any issue relating to this character have been insane. Right. And then you'll usually see a little bit of residual effect, right? You'll see 310, 311 probably carry some of that heat, regardless of how good the book is. But, you know, talking Midtown, at one time I empathized for them because I thought maybe they would just charge a little bit more for books to hire some more people that would ship them because they like to ship shit late as almost almost said that word. They they don't ship on time either. So you're going to pay $30 for a book and you probably get it in like three weeks. But, Okay, USA. But we're moving on into the next one on the variant buzz. We're going to talk about that Thor number two fourth print. That's right. I mean, like we said, this is a week of late printings. Um, Marvel has been rolling out these late printings. Uh, this is one thing I have to give Marvel credit for. And we're certainly critical of the big two quite often on the channel. Um, but they have noticed the trend of the late printings. They are rolling them out. So we're getting a fourth print of Thor 2. Thor 2 has a lot going for it from Black Winter cameo to the tease, you know, DC Marvel crossover from Donny Cates, which has so much more meaning with this upcoming image crossover series. So, you know, there's a lot of interest in this issue. They're going to keep rolling out uh, late printings, I think, of Thor 2, and I'm going to keep buying them. Here's another book that from Image we haven't really talked about much we did talk about it on FOC when the first issue came out. We talked about it a little bit later. But, but we get Philadelphia back on the list. But I don't think it's just for that title. It's because it's got that kick-ass Scotty Young variant for it as well. Right. And the juxtaposition of Scotty Young, a very synonymous all-ages artist, doing a very you know violent-looking kind of graphic cover in a very violent graphic book. So this is kind of the recipe for success. Think Ice Cream Man with the Dr. Seuss cover. If you can take something that is very synonymous with our positivity and our childhood, and then you can uh, mix that with gruesome, bloody horror, that seems to be a recipe for success. Yeah. Scotty Young all ages, because, you know, I like to let my kids read it. <laughs> I hate Fairyland and I'm kidding. <laughs> But yes, I do get the point. The baby variants is what he's known for, for sure. But the next one also on the variant buzz, we're going to talk about that Immortal Hulk number 35. Just like you said, we're talking about a lot of late printings here and here we're getting that second print as well. Yeah, not a key issue. I just think uh, gorgeous Alex Ross cover art and you get the line art here with this black and white. Um, a lot of these black and whites get overlooked and they're not even my, they're not my favorite. It's not, that's a simple, that's pretty much, uh, akin to a color change, but I would rather see the line art than I would a color change because we've seen some of these line arts take off and they're tough over time to keep in good condition because of that white cover. But especially when you're talking about a masterful artist like Alex Ross, this only uh, goes to highlight how amazing he is. So this cover is gorgeous. And I think that that's really why you're seeing this thing sell out. Plus coming out in a week, if, I, if I'm looking at a diamond FOC order sheet, right? And I'm just looking at late printings. Take everything else away and just look at late printings. You're looking at uh, First Robin King, Strange Academy, and you're looking at Thor number two. Those are all books that are going to get your attention before Immortal Hulk 35. So I think that Immortal Hulk 35 was probably ordered less than a lot of those books. And because of that, it's kind of selling out faster. Yeah, speaking of Alex Ross and line art. Have you seen the price of Jim Lee's commissions that came oh, out? Man. Could you imagine if Midtown sold those? Oh man. <laughs> just yeah. Just stick it in there, right? Just take it, take it, Midtown, take it. 
<laughs> but the last one we're talking about on the variant buzz is we got that Spider-Man Noir number three, that one in 25 variant. Yeah, and this is, you talked about holdover. This is residual holdover from um, Spider-Man Noir number two, the Dave Johnson variant doing exceptionally well. So this one pre-sold above ratio. Now, again, your favorite punk ass bitches have a lot to do with that because Midtown pre-sold this one for $35, $10 over ratio, $10 over what they would typically sell um, a, a one in 25 variant. And again, I think they were using the same logic of the holdover. We talked about this with the Dave Johnson one. We said that that book wasn't necessarily successful because of Spider-Man Noir or, and I mean, there's a lot I could say about scarcity and like, you know, who's ordering 25 copies of Spider-Man Noir, honestly. Um, so I'm sure the book is scarce, uh, but really the, the Dave Johnson cover was amazing. So that's what, that's what got people's attention. And, and the style and design of the cover was different from what you're seeing from a lot of variant covers. So that got the market's attention. This is what Brian talks about. And we've seen this guy. So this is one of those patterns to pay attention to. I'm not down on this book. What I'm trying to do is educate you that there's op a opportunities to use this to your advantage. If you're coming off a red hot issue, you can sometimes get in on, or if you get in early enough on the next issue, if you were able to get this book, like let's say for 20 bucks, you could double your money on this book real easy right now. Um, and, and, I don't necessarily think that's a price that's going to hold. Um, at the same point, it's something to watch out for and avoid. Uh, you know, if you're, e, e, this is someone that you may want to wait a little bit if you were trying to pick up for your PC because it's hot today because of the residual price due to what number two did that could and should come down. Right, and there's some risk involved in that too. You, know, you hear about the buzz and you try to kick, pick, pick up on those residual books. Um, Think about how many people might have bought Batman 51. Right. <laughs> but there it is, guys. There's that variant buzz section we just wrapped up. So now we have Jack's long-term play. Here's a book we talked about a little bit early in the list, but Jack's going to go into more detail now and tell us why he thinks this is a great one to pick up and just stash in your long box. And we're talking about that Three Jokers number one. Now, the, the reviews of this book have been mixed. Um, I think people were expecting action packed out of the gate. You, there's no huge reveal. There's no shocking twist in issue number one that is going to draw headlines. Um, there's a great, I'll say, I don't want to say interaction that may not be strong enough um, with Jason Todd and, and the Joker. Um, and, and, uh, and let's just say Jason Todd will... Uh, extract some revenge that is certainly um, a buzzworthy to an extent but I don't think it's going to draw headlines the key to this is this is a chance to essentially go back in a time machine you mentioned the killing joke I really think that three jokers has a, a, a potential to be this this generation's dark knight rises or killing joke or those kind of seminal Batman stories. We've been leading up to this for a long time. We can talk about negatives, right? We can talk about how long it took to us to get here. We can talk about Jeff Johns and kind of the way that his publishing schedule never stays uh, on pace with the doomsday clock and everything else. We can talk about, you know, the multitude of covers and, and maybe market disinterest or splitting Joker interest amongst three jokers and joker war um you know the general high print run of this book you can you can bring up all the negatives you want to me all of those are positives uh this is a book that's going to be available it's going to be on the stands for cover price for a long time i don't think it's going to dry up for a while um i i'm a big advocate of putting sets together i'll say right now my long-term play would be this entire set putting this entire set together. Uh, I think by the time you get down the line in the later issues, those first prints of issue one and issue two will start to become harder and harder to get. Um, I also think the multitude of variant covers, there's gonna be people putting together that Joker variant set. But I, I think I have confidence in the story. I have confidence in where it's gonna go. But I either way think that this has been such an anticipated story. And the Joker is so important to the overall mythos of DC Comics. And when you look at the history of what iconic Joker stories have meant 
to the back issue market long term. I really think that this is an opportunity. Um, imagine if we were sitting here, uh, you know, on the the heels of the release of Killing Joke, and we were talking about an opportunity to go to your LCS and pick up a hundred copies if you wanted for cover price. You know, I mean, how amazing would that be? But what people always forget in that scenario is you're never gonna when you're really in that situation. You there's risk involved. You never um know that the killing joke is going to be the killing joke when it's you know just been released so we don't know that three jokers is going to be this iconic thing um but again the anticipation oh my god it's been building for what two years two years right the anticipation the character involved the the universe it exists within be specifically you know gotham city and in the bat family um the writer who's behind it, the fact that the entire publishing house is behind it, the interest in the Joker in general right now in the market, whether it's Joker War or the Joker movie or, um, or the anticipation of maybe a Johnny Depp Joker in the upcoming the Batman movie, uh, just Joker is red hot. Now is the time. I really think that this is going to be one that we look at for a long time, for years to come as an important book to have. And, and the, the print run and things like that don't, that doesn't slow me down. That's why this is a long-term play. The long-term play is designed not to be the flip of the week. If you want to make a great flip this week, get Canto. If you can get Canto for cover price, you're going to make a great, great, great flip. Um, some of these uh, late printings, same deal. I think if you get them for cover price three, four weeks from now, you could be selling them three, four times cover price. At the same point, I think if you're looking for a long-term play, if you're going to flip your Canto and put your profits into something that you want to sit on for the next five years that you think you know can make you five to ten times your money, I think Three Jokers is that property. Yeah, I was definitely going to say don't be shy if you go into the LCS. You know they're going to have like a full rack just for Three Jokers number one with the covers. And like you said, it's going to look like, oh, man, I got so many of them. Pick that up. This is one I like the long-term play on this, and I'll tell you why. Because Jeff Johns, one of my favorite writers, always writes great stories, always has those ones. He's kind of like that Donny Cates where he builds the story up. And yeah. Doomsday Clock, everyone knows. I really enjoyed Doomsday Clock. Yes, it was cursed with the release schedule. But these are the type of books also that I see – being read years from now when they're collected in trade paperback, hardcover edition, deluxe hardcover edition. And as more people pick those up in the collected editions, they're gonna, if they enjoy that story, they're automatically gonna go back and start hunting floppies. And there might be a lot out there, but they might be tucked in collections. But at the same time, that lottery ticket buy-in at that point, you might be able to sell, if, if you wanna sell it, for a little bit more money. And these are the stories that literally future movies will be based upon. Um, so I, I sit and I look at this one and I say, um, 20 years from now, we very well may be talking about the Three Jokers film, uh, you know, the same way we're all trying to get, say, a proper killing joke done or, um, you know, a proper death in the family done. So there it is, guys. There's Jack's long-term play as well as the Bolo list. Let us know what books you guys picked up. Let us know what stories you enjoyed reading, even if they aren't on this list. This has been Brian Jack with Men's Comics. See you guys in the next video. Go and try your luck. Test me in again. We let it rain. Please don't start us up. Got that black and white, that yin and yang. Mr. Officer, please don't search us. We don't